The crisis is that after this reinterpretation has been going on for a few hundred years, suddenly the question emerges, what now do these beliefs mean? If they don't contradict science, it is no longer obvious what they mean. To say that God created the world is very understandable as long as it contradicts some scientific theory or other. But if you say uh, it doesn't contradict any scientific theory, there's nothing that science can possibly find out that could conflict with the belief that God created the world, then it becomes questionable what it means to say that God created the world and so with other religious beliefs. The big problem, I suppose, for religious belief in our time is no longer quite so much what's the evidence for them or what's the evidence against them because most people probably have redefined in such a way that evidence is no longer very clearly relevant to them. And in that what now do these beliefs mean? Instead of dwelling further on this point, I will proceed to what I take to be the second and the third aspect of the crisis, then say what I think Kierkegaard had to say on each of these points, and then leave it to you in our question and answer period after the lecture to probe any particular aspect that especially interests you. The second great crisis in religion is of a moral nature. If somebody says, and seriously means it, that whatever is in the Bible, whether that be defined as the Hebrew Bible only or as the Old and New Testament both, that whatever is in the Bible is the word of God and that all the moral commandments to be found in the Bible are imposed on us by God, then we have what seems morally a clear position. But that is not what the modern religious believer says. But the people in the past have said quite that, I needn't go into right now. Here certainly we have an aspect of the religious crisis today that has his root, its roots through the centuries that's not completely new today. I do think it's more acute today than it has been in the past. People select much more consciously and much more individually now than they have ever done in the past what commandments they recognize and what commandments they don't recognize. If you confront people with some commandment in the Bible that is contrary to their conscience, very few people, I think, are greatly disturbed by that anymore. They will just say, well, obviously that belongs to some uh, very ancient strata of the Bible, that's an old idea, it's a primitive idea, that doesn't go for us anymore. Well, where is the crisis? All this seems very fine. The crisis is that if you are the one who does the choosing and picking as to which commandments are still binding on you, then what is the relevance of God to morality? What is the relevance of religion to morality? Aren't, in that case, religious believers and agnostics and atheists all in the same boat? In that case, they all find out what their morality is going to be, what their ethical code is going to be, by beginning with what they have been taught in the nursery, then revising that in the light of their own conscience, of their own experience, of their own reason, asking themselves more or less deliberately what stands up and what doesn't stand up under scrutiny, 
And then, very much as an afterthought, there's suddenly a difference between the religious person and the irreligious person. Namely, the religious person then suddenly says, and this, of course, I believe because the Bible says so. But to that extent, isn't the religious person deceiving himself? Is he really believing these things because the Bible says so? Apparently not, because there are other things in the Bible that he does not accept. Doesn't God then become redundant? Don't God and religion really, in that case, become irrelevant to life? And aren't they brought in in a way that is not entirely honest anymore? This is the moral dimension of the religious crisis. And the third aspect is even more obviously age-old and I think not particularly modern, but it has its application in the 20th century and particularly since World War II. You might say that there is in organized religion an inverse proportion of quantity and quality. The more people crowd the temples and the churches, the shallower does religion become. This is not anything new, but it is something that's vividly illustrated in our time since World War II. But it is an old story, it's something that you find in the Hebrew Bible again and again and again, that uh, the prophets are not greatly cheered by the fact that temple attendance is up higher than ever, that people are trampling the courts. On the contrary, this they find rather disgusting. They don't say, well, this is wonderful, there are more sacrifices now than there used to be. Now all we need is that we put in God we trust on our coins or something of that sort, or if we had postage stamps that we cancel them, pray for peace. But what the prophets are concerned about is the terrible loss of quality of religion and the prophets have a term for this the remnant shall return the idea that deep religion genuine religion is perhaps possible only for small groups but this is an old idea the idea, if you want to put it somewhat aggressively, which is appropriate if we want to connect this in a moment with Kierkegaard, that perhaps organized religion is something of a cancer, something that proliferates without aim and threatens to kill genuine religiousness. This may not be, this need not be, all there is to organized religion, but this is the awful danger of it. This is a perpetual crisis, and if we think about our time rather than thinking about biblical times, perhaps the last two very great religious figures who protested against the churches and against organized religion in the name of a religious vision of their own were Leo Tolstoy, who was excommunicated by the Greek Orthodox Church, and Zuren Kierkegaard, who in a kind of a way broke with his own church. Now, if we then relate Kierkegaard to the crisis in religion, he is easiest to relate to this last point. He denounces organized religion, not necessarily in principle. He doesn't say there shouldn't be churches, but he thinks that the churches that exist in his own time in Denmark in the 1840s and 50s somehow don't come up to scratch at all. And if we look at what he criticizes the churches in his own country in the 19th century for, it is quite clear that his criticisms also apply at least as much, if not more, to the churches in our time. It is interesting in that connection that what he would like the churches to do is to be much more authoritarian. He attacks them because they don't lay down the law to people, because they are too liberal. But surely the same would apply to our churches today, which more or less take the attitude that as long as you go to any church or temple or something of the sort, it's all right that any religious faith will do, no matter what it is, that one ought to have some faith in some organized religion or other, 
and let me be blunt, not take it too seriously. If you think that I'm myself not entirely serious about this, let me give an illustration that, uh, even if you would find it mildly ridiculous, will bring out how dead serious I am about it. I don't think that the people of the United States today would stand for a presidential candidate who would not be affiliated with some organized religion. They do want their candidates to have some ties to some organized religion. But if Mr. Kennedy said, I take my Roman Catholicism seriously, he'd be through. And if Mr. Nixon were really a Quaker, instead of saying, I am in favor of fighting, then he would be through. What they want is a Quaker who is no Quaker and a Roman Catholic who is no Roman Catholic. It's in this sense that our revival of religion on organized religion is in a way a very shallow and misleading thing that has very little to do with deep religiousness. The person who is deeply religious would get into trouble in the United States today and certainly couldn't be elected to high office any more than the person who is openly atheistic. It's more complicated if we try to relate Kierkegaard to the other process. But still, something can be said about these two. What about his attitude toward the meaning of religious beliefs when they no longer come into conflict with science? Kierkegaard's answer here is clear. He thinks that religious beliefs do conflict with science, that they must not be reinterpreted in such a way that they won't conflict with science. He thinks that religious beliefs, and the particular religious beliefs in which he is interested, those of Christianity, as he understands it, are, to use the word that he uses again and again, absurd. It's Kierkegaard who introduced this word absurd into the vocabulary of existentialism, though it may be possibly more familiar to many of you from the writings of Albert Camus. No, religious beliefs, he thinks, are, Christian beliefs, are to reason absurd, and one must accept them nevertheless. One must humbly accept what one cannot comprehend. And one must oppose critical thinking. And one must be unscientific. And one must denounce science. One could go into great detail here and quote any number of texts in Kierkegaard, and if there should be any demand for that in the discussion period, I'm willing to do so. But uh, I would also suggest, if you are willing, some of you, to do some reading on Kierkegaard, that you will find a good deal of material if you will read, let us say, at least two things, Kierkegaard's own book, Fear and Trembling, and perhaps by way of rounding out my lecture, to find information that I did not put into this lecture because it's available in print, Chapter 10, the chapter on Kierkegaard in my book, From Shakespeare to Existentialism, a book, incidentally, that on the little folder that you got is credited to Miss Hazel Barnes. But I, in the bargain, was credited with a much bigger book, namely Her, The Literature of Possibility, uh, which is published by the University of Nebraska. That is one mistake in this little bibliography. The last item there is Miss Barnes, and the one directly above that is mine. Both those books, Fear and Trembling and My From Shakespeare to Existentialism, are available in paperback. And by reading Fear and Trembling and uh, my chapter on Kierkegaard, you will get a much fuller picture of Kierkegaard than you will just from this lecture alone. What about the moral selection? Here it is Kierkegaard's point that you have no right whatsoever to make any moral selection. You should not do that. That if God would tell you 
to sacrifice your own son, to commit murder, <coughs> you have no right to say this cannot be God because this is contrary to conscience. Because if you do that, then God is reduced to a mere redundancy. Then you don't need God at all. Then you take the name of the Lord in vain by just introducing him afterwards to sanction what you believe anyway. No, you must countenance the possibility, if your religion is at all meaningful, you must countenance the possibility that, re that religion may not only outrage your reason, but your conscience too. A very profound point, I think, for every religious person to ponder, whether if he does not countenance the possibility that God might go against conscience, God is not truly irrelevant to morality altogether. If conscience is supreme, then why do you need God in morality? If, on the other hand, you take God seriously in ethics, then there's the possibility that he might possibly go against conscience. Now in conclusion, we are confronted with the oddity that if we consider what Kierkegaard has to say on these three aspects of the crisis, you will find him very probably unacceptable on at least two of the three points, perhaps on all three. Probably some of you will sympathize with this attitude toward organized religion, though some others of you will feel that it's too extreme. Probably very few of you will agree with him that religion ought to overrule reason and that one ought to believe things that are absurd. And perhaps, I don't know, none of you or hardly any of you will agree that religion could or should go against conscience. Is Kierkegaard then really just an outrageous fellow who has very strange and bizarre ideas, which after all are just interesting, but who doesn't really have much to say to us? That is not my view. I think that on all three of these points, he deserves terribly serious consideration one can, on all three points, obviously accept pretty much what he says if one then draws the conclusion that religion is to be rejected for that very reason. He is much more of a thorn in the flesh and meant to be for the religious believer. But let me conclude this lecture by bringing out three points on which he seems to me to be particularly particularly worthwhile. Number one, we find in Kierkegaard, and particularly in that very difficult and abstruse book, The Sickness Unto Death, which comes together with Fear and Trembling in the same paperback volume, complete and unabridged, we find him saying in that, that almost all men are in despair, whether they know it or not, the one exception being the true Christian, if there should be any true Christian today. Now this at first glance seems meaningless. Does it make any sense to say that somebody is in despair but he doesn't know it? This seems very strange. It seems as if he didn't know how to use language. Here you can try to defend him in two ways. The first way of defending him would be, uh, if I may say so, the theological way, namely you redefine the terms. And this Kierkegaard does, sort of in passing, but if this were all there were to him, I personally wouldn't take him terribly seriously. He does say that despair can be defined as the wrong relationship to God. Well, of course, if you say that, then you can say that almost all men are the r in the wrong relationship to God, although they don't know it. There's no paradox about that. But then why call that despair? That's arbitrary, to save a paradox by redefining the terms. But Kierkegaard also says something much more interesting to my mind in the same book, namely that despair means being in a wrong relation to oneself. And might it not be the case that almost all men are in the wrong relationship to themselves, although they don't know it? That makes a lot of sense, and we can specify what this wrong relationship to themselves is. 
They are running away from themselves. They are trying to escape from themselves. And this surely is a profound analysis of modern man, and we can leave open the possibility that perhaps it's a profound analysis not only of modern man, possibly of men at all times. And Kierkegaard would say further that philosophy and science and society all help men to escape from themselves, all help men to run away from themselves. Men are afraid of being alone with themselves because they might encounter themselves. They're afraid of solitude. As Kierkegaard once puts it, they can't think of any better use for solitude than as a horrible punishment. So they seek togetherness. They seek community activities. And the churches help them. The churches become great centers for community activities. The churches help men to escape from themselves. Here I think we have point number one that's eminently worthwhile. Point number two is that he is against Hegel's dictum that our society is the freest that ever existed and that what we should do is absorb its values and conform and believe in progress and be proud of our achievements. But surely that wasn't just the view of Hegel, that's the view of almost all our secondary school teachers in the United States today. <laughs> and Kierkegaard says that this is a terrible view, that we should realize that this optimism is unfounded, that there the true individual, the person who takes problems seriously, is in despair. His problems are not solved by science and society. And what you should do is not conform and not absorb the values of your society, but stand alone. That's point number two. And third and last. Kierkegaard's criticism of liberal Christianity and perhaps of liberal religion quite generally bears thinking about. And his interpretation of Christianity as deeply authoritarian, although perhaps not very appealing to the 20th century mind, might well be historically more correct than the more appealing interpretations to which we are accustomed today. When Kierkegaard says that Christianity is authoritarian, I think he is right. But he is also right when he says that Christianity teaches us to leave father and mother and to stand alone. That the original teaching of Jesus is not that the family that prays together stays together, <laughs> but quite to the contrary, that you should not pray together, but that you should shut the door and pray by yourself. Here Kierkegaard speaks as a true heir, not just of Jesus, but perhaps of the prophets too. Let me end with a final dig against a very popular contrast today, with which probably most of you are familiar. That between the good guys and the bad guys, the authoritarians and the humanists, we classify people and the authoritarians are the bad guys and Kierkegaard clearly was authoritarian. You can quote him along that line again and again. And the humanists, they have the good beliefs. One thing that I will try to get across in all of these lectures and quite emphatically today in the first one is that one can learn a great deal from people who were authoritarian and that Kierkegaard was one of them. We must not say people are black and white. Let's first see whether they're on the right side. And if they were, we will learn from them. But we may find that people who outrage us and to embarrass us and to annoy us and with whom we differ may be among the people from whom we have the most to learn. And that's one reason why I'm devoting these three lectures to three very outrageous people. Now, let's have questions, please speak loudly enough that not only I can hear you, but other people too.
existentialism rather is somebody betting against accepted conditions. If I understand the question right, you found somewhere that existentialism was defined as the belief that one just goes from crisis to crisis. I don't think that would be a very good definition of existentialism. This is not a point on which the people who are chiefly called existentialists have taken any particular stand. But you might say, and this is what I did try to say, that existentialists, instead of emphasizing what is ordinary and usual in life, emphasize the crises and so give the impression that life consists very largely of crises. Between what? Oh. I must confess that I have not read Miss Rand's novels, but I understand that she is a great admirer of Nietzsche's, and so, if so, there probably is some connection, though obviously one should not read all of her ideas back into Nietzsche and either give him credit for them or blame him for them. He very clearly did attack uh, liberal and reformed religions. Now, what his attitude toward various forms of orthodoxy would be is a little bit difficult to say. One extraordinary thing, I think, about Kierkegaard is that he did not address himself to religions other than his own. That, for example, he never even writes about Calvinism. He treats Calvinism as non-existent. He does not discuss the Roman Catholic Church, much less does he discuss Orthodox Judaism, that by temperament he would have some feeling for Orthodoxy that he wouldn't have for Liberalism is clear, I think. But whether he would particularly applaud any such positions, I am not sure, because one thing that's very clear in Kierkegaard is that he does not share the admiration for organized religion as such or for a deep religious faith, whatever that may be, that's so fashionable today, but he wants a particular interpretation of Christianity, and anything that doesn't agree with that he rejects. I think the answer is no, but the answer is also that it would that this is not a terribly relevant objection. Perhaps one doesn't have to worry about that too much. Yes, but I think uh, we, we haven't come to Sartre yet. We've talked about Kierkegaard today, and I think it would be fair to say that Kierkegaard is not too terribly worried any more than I should think Jesus was, and Kierkegaard is a Christian, he is not too terribly worried about whether mankind will survive or whether it will not survive. What he is worried about is the other world, is going to heaven. And what he concerns himself with, in line with a tradition that is strong in Christianity, and by no means totally absent from Judaism either. What he concerns himself with is what you might call the remnant, the exceptional individuals. 
Now, I'm not trying to say that you should accept this. There's something, as I've tried to bring out, deeply undemocratic about his whole attitude. He is not concerned about the greatest possible happiness of the greatest possible number. Not at all. What he is concerned with is how a man might become a good Christian, or if you want to put it differently, what the individual might have to do in order to be saved when he dies. This is something that's puzzling in many a reformer, that he revolts against the church, but then may add, and this is Kierkegaard's line clearly, that he revolts against it in part because it isn't authoritarian enough. So it's easy to sympathize with him because of his individualism, but you might say, if ever you got your way, if ever you got your will, what would happen to people like you? It's a similar feeling, just first of all by way of bringing out that this problem isn't confined to Kierkegaard, that one might have, for example, about a man like Plato, who criticizes the society that he lives in, Athenian democracy, because it isn't authoritarian enough, and he is a great rebel and a great individualist and a great iconoclast and a great critic, but what he would like to have is the kind of society in which people like he would have no place at all. Now we have something similar to that very clearly in Kierkegaard. And I think what he would say is that certain kinds of belief should be insisted on by the church and that there should not be any leeway when it comes to whether you do or don't accept central dogmas about Christ, but that, of course, the individual might have some leeway in having some deep experience. What he objects to is a religion in which deep experience is something that would be an embarrassment, in which deep experience would almost disqualify anybody from membership because it just wouldn't be long, because it would be so extraordinary and exceptional. The deep experience is compatible, I should think, with a more authoritarian setup. Perhaps I can draw an analogy here which will be familiar to some of you, and that would be that perhaps in Orthodox Judaism, in religious services, you would be much more likely to see many people seized by stark religious experience than you would in more liberal services. And perhaps you would find the same sort of thing also between fundamentalist Protestant services and liberal services. The deepness and the intensity of the experience is compatible with a good deal of traditionalism and orthodoxy. I think that this is particularly frightful rather than being something that in any way can reconcile one to Kierkegaard. I think that with a strangely and disturbingly prophetic soul, he rightly sees that his night of faith is not a fanatic with fire and sword, 
that the man who is willing to commit atrocities with a firm faith that everything will come out all right and who, to be drastic about it, comes back, say, from his uh, having liquidated a few million people to his family and is a very nice father and a very nice husband and, as Kierkegaard puts it, to quote him, in ordinary life you can't tell him from a tax collector. I think he is dead right about this, and I find it deeply disturbing, but most people are too romantic and too dramatic about it. They think that people who commit deeds like that must be obviously monsters, as if they sort of must have horns and tail. But Kierkegaard sees quite rightly that if a man has the firm faith that what he is doing is all right, and that in the end it will all be for the best, even though if you argue with him, he'll have to admit that it's absurd, how could it come out for the best, still he believes somehow it will, then he can afterwards go back to his family and be quite undisturbed. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. But a man like Kierkegaard wistfully deplores his own rationality, his own integrity, his own conscience, saying, if I did a thing like that, I would not be able to go back. And instead of saying, that's because I am too decent a man, he says, that's because I don't have the kind of faith that one ought to have. At this point, obviously, I don't agree with him at all, and I don't suppose any of you had the idea in the first place during my lecture that I am in any sense a follower of Kierkegaard, even though I tried to give a sympathetic interpretation. What I explain today is that Kierkegaard has found among so many people today who really disagree with him. Imagine is so contrary to the spirit of modern time. Because it's much more fascinating to deal with somebody who deals with interesting problems that have some relation to one's own life than to read about things that strike one as wholly academic and irrelevant to one's own life. I think that's the main reason. A secondary reason is that you wrote well, and a tertiary reason is that there are some psychological insights that sort of spice the reading. There was a lady a little to the left there. Kierkegaard thought, and at this point I find him impossible to follow, he thought that the only way to transcend this despair was by being a good Christian. At this point I simply cannot follow. This doesn't make any sense to me at all. First of all, you might say, well, uh, Let's be a little bit more broad-minded. What about being a Jew or what about being a Buddhist? Couldn't one transcend it in that way too? Or one might ask, what about being the kind of man, let's say, that we will come across as we consider Nietzsche and Sartre, familiar to some of you from Camus' novels? Might it not be possible without any religious faith? I think here Kierkegaard doesn't argue but is just dogmatic. And to me, at this point, he isn't plausible at all. I can take just one more short question. I don't see why the Orthodox Church, why a church that would measure up to Kierkegaard's expectations, would have to condemn Abraham. What Kierkegaard is saying, in effect, is the parson is a hypocrite if he praises Abraham Sunday morning, but Sunday afternoon, if a member of his congregation should go out to do likewise, but try to stop him. But now, why couldn't somebody first preach faith and then if people also have got it, cheer them for it and be happy about it. 
I would say that the dreadful thing at this point is that the church so often has done again just what Kierkegaard wanted it to do, that people have preached to other people to go out and burn other people at the stake and kill other people and then have not stopped them either but quite consistently allowed them to go ahead with that. You're entirely right that according to Kierkegaard, Abram couldn't communicate it, but the parson might do what Kierkegaard says he would do, just reverently stand back and say, here is a great man, here is the kind of man who resembles Abraham, let's canonize him. On that note, let's close for today.